I think this could be the point in time we look back on in the future and think, you know, monolithic chains kind of died during the bear market of 2022. And now you've got Ethereum with its roll-up centric roadmap. And then you got things like Celestia, Fuel, and these modular stacks. And, you know, Cosmos can fit into that as well. But I think it just really hinges on them creating a better community and improving the tokenomics and value capture. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research, a show hosted by analysts for analysts. We're going to ask the tough questions. And if you're really into crypto, then this is the show for you. I'm your co-host, Sam Martin. And I'm Dan Smith. You know, this show is made possible by our incredible sponsors, Chainalysis and Flipside. Uh, today, we got a little roundup episode for you. We're going to hit all the hot topics. You know, obviously, the X FTX news, uh, wildly disappointing and a wildly massive topic for our industry. Uh, so we'll definitely touch on that. Uh, I think we should, first we can kind of rip a little hot seat, cool throne session. Uh, let's see, Sam, you want to you wanna break us down, start us off? And uh, who do you got in the hot seat this week? Yeah, the hot seat's pretty easy for me this week. I've got pretty much all PFP NFT projects. You've got Board Ape Yacht Club down 40% just today on the floor, and we're recording on Monday, November 14th. Uh, Mutinate Yacht Club, the derivative of Board Apes, had a floor north of 100K at one point during the bull run, and now a Board Ape Yacht Club NFT only costs 60K. So uh, definitely some downward price action on NFTs. You got Art Gobblers that you know moon to a 10 ETH floor that we talked about last week, and now they're down to 2 ETH. And a lot of these projects have really little runway in their treasuries, so definitely bearish on the PFPs. What do you guys think? I think they'll come back, but you know it might be a long bear market for PFP NFT projects. I think that we're probably just getting started on that front. I think Bored Apes, Mutant Apes, and even the Blue Chip Doodles, etc. They still probably have a while to go, at least against ETH to the downside. I definitely think NFTs are well set to have a good a good next bull run, but whether or not that's going to be like one of one music NFTs or PFPs, I'm not so sure. I think this brings up an interesting question is like, should these PFP NFTs have utility or rather should it just be like some sort of culture? Like I know we have the, the crypto dick butts um, and those like have absolutely no utility. It's literally just memes. Um, is that what the PFPs are going to look like in the future or are we... Is it going to be more like uh, the board apes where there's like other side metaverses and there's way more utility? Like, I don't know, this sort of puts a question on what is what is the future of NFTs, especially those PFP NFTs? 1D equals 1B, true stability. <laughs> to keep the uh, the NFT hot seat going, uh, I actually have Joe Pegs, uh, the Avalanche project on, on, my, on my hot seat. They <laughs> reached just... Literally today, uh, Monday the 14th, they announced uh, that FTX Ventures was part of their most recent raise. Uh, that's just like so tone deaf to be announcing that right now. I mean, I get you probably have some mandate to put that information out, but uh, just a brutal, brutal timing. And on the, the announcement thread, it like, you know, they had to like put a second tweet out that's like, obviously this announcement came at a bad time. It's like, okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Really, really appreciate the insight in this, the secondary apology there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is kind of a, just shows the far reaching uh, uh, arm of what FTX really was and, and how they kind of had their claws into all these different corners of the market. Um, but then again, like Avalanche, on the day the FTX was melting down, uh, it was first like hitting everyone's timeline, they announced that uh, they were <laughs> launching their merch store. So uh, just true, true, poor, poor timing for back to back announcements for the Avalanche team. At the same time, though, Jopex does manage to ship really well. They, uh, they have concentrated liquidity AMM. They launched the NFT marketplace, you know, two, three months ago with a couple NFTs that were doing pretty well. So, like, I do respect that team heavily. It is uh, pretty hilarious, though, that they announced that raise right in the middle of all of this. But I guess, like you said, they definitely had to. Matt, who you got on the hot seat this week? My hot seat today is just all custodians. I'm taking the easy route. Um, so obviously FTX is causing bad sediment among you know anyone who holds money on exchanges. There's been huge net outflows of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of their assets from centralized exchanges. Weirdly, there's also been net outflows from DeFi. I think that people are just really on top of like, I don't want to be taking any risk with my funds right now. I want, you know, my keys, my crypto. I want control of every aspect. Um, when the sentiment's a little better, when things have cleared up, maybe I'll go put money somewhere where I can earn a little bit of yield. But for now, I just want it in my pocket. 
I think that we're going to see that same idea continue with centralized exchanges and custodians for a long time. Maybe I'm being a little bit optimistic here, but I hope that this is like a complete drastic catalyst for, you know, self-custody that people really start managing their own funds. Um, you know, whether or not that's the case, this isn't the first exchange we've seen hacked. You know, the same thing happened with Mt. Gox, the same thing happens every cycle. But I'm hoping this time there's enough eyes on the industry that it really does have a you know, long lasting change for for how people view holding their assets. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. And what's been interesting is the past few days, the, the trust token uh, for the trust wallet has been absolutely ripping, which I think plays into that narrative that I think people realize self custody is going to be way more of a thing, especially everyone getting burned by all these custodians. So yeah, I can't agree with you more. I just think about like, how do we make self custody a better UI UX, right? mostly on the UX side, right? Like, I just think about the average person getting their private keys and knowing if they need to like secure this information, like, and if they lose it, it's like a one way street, there's no going back. It's like, I just don't know if that's the best way to onboard new people. I love how crypto has the optionality so more sophisticated users can um, self custody and hold their own assets. But I, I do think like to true mass adoption, that self custody in its current form uh, just doesn't really facilitate that ma that level of mass adoption, right? Like, I think you do need these centralized custodians uh, to kind of reach critical mass of, of, of users and market penetration. Uh, so I'd really like, I really hope that the outcome of this whole FTX drama ends up being that all eyes do shift on these centralized entities and we somehow find a way to hold them to better standards, whether that's like social consensus. Um, you know, I, I know in the early days uh, when exchanges and custodians first started being a thing, like Bitcoiners would organize days where they'd all withdraw their assets at the same time just to test these exchanges. Uh, so I don't know if it's like trying to bring some sort of like co uh, social regulation into it or if the, like we do get, you know, over uh, like a, a, a true regulation policy uh, put in place for these centralized players, these centralized custodians, uh, and and kind of, you know, it's a shame that we, like we couldn't do the policing ourselves. But uh, you know, I think we have hit a point where if we want to continue growing, and and we really do need uh, these centralized entities to be playing uh, the right game. So it, it's kind of a shame that's come down to this. But yeah, I'd ho I'd hope to see some regulation that kind of forced these these larger players, these larger institutions, uh, to be accountable. Yeah, literally just everyone's scared right now. Like no one wants to hold funds on a centralized exchange. Everyone is watching their wallets super closely. We saw that with the drama with Crypto.com and Gate.io over the weekend, you know, shuffling some funds around by accident. So I think people are just on edge and I think it's like a net positive for the space in terms of people learning to self-custody. But it's also a little bit optimistic to think that people won't forget about it in, a, in you know, two, three, four months time. But hopefully this time we uh, we actually learn. But uh, Westy, who you got on your hot seat this week? Yeah, I'm, for me, I got Solana on my hot seat, which is definitely an obvious one given the week that they've had. I mean, the Sol token's down, I think, at least 60% in the past few weeks, uh, given just their ties to FTX. Um, but also, like, within the ecosystem, they've been having a lot of trouble. So FTX was at, actually, like, the the holder um, of collateral for the, the Solid um, token. So they had, I think, wrapped Bitcoin and wrapped ETH, which are trading at the Bitcoins at like 1500 right now. And the wrapped ETH is at 250. And so trading at like ridiculous, ridiculously low value uh, versus par. Um, but also I'm hearing rumblings that FTX uh, had the keys to Serum as well, which is literally the, the backbone of Solana DeFi. Um, and so I think Jump is leading the charge to try and fork Serum to to make sure it's more to to get away from that the FTX private key as well as to make it more community focused, which I think could be a good thing in the long run, but definitely hurting right now. But I also think like the long term effects of um, FTX being uh, like a, a big investor in the ecosystem. Oftentimes, like Almeida and FTX are one of the biggest investors in all these projects, and so. What happens if new Solana projects are trying to raise, or maybe the the older Solana projects had their their treasuries with Almeida or on FTX? Like, how difficult is it for them to to raise in the future? And so, you know, this sort of 
makes you question where does Solana DeFi go from here. It's pretty bleak. Yeah, I've had Anatoly and Solana on my hot seat the last two weeks. So, Westy, you stole my thunder there. But I guess just to take the contrarian take, like, I don't think I've ever seen an asset that everyone's just talking so poorly about. Like, in the grand scheme of things, and we did talk about this last week, but I would rather hold a bag of soul right now over AVAX. And I would stand by that even despite all the drama. Like, there's some good builders over there. There's some cool projects. Anatoly is, like, a really smart guy. So, yeah, uh, I definitely feel them on the hot seat, but uh, I'm trying to be a, a contrarian and, and take a, a bet that no one else wants to take right now. Yeah, I mean, the sad part about it is, is like this just kind of highlights that every time we saw one of these Solana DeFi protocols launching a token with this insanely predatory model of, you know, 4% of circulating supply uh, relative to fully diluted supply circulating, uh, it's just like, so brutal to think that you know this was really truly was Alameda behind all of this just ripping money out of retail's hands um you know like we we thought that at the time but actually having the context now it's painting a pretty grim picture um and so i feel like solana as an ecosystem is really going to have like you know two defining points of its existence right it was like the pre-ftx and the post-ftx era um so it's going to be really interesting to see you know, how if they can really pull the community back in and say, all right, like, let's build from this. And, uh, you know, we were under like the, the Alameda FTX claw and the grasp of their, their power. But, you know, now it's time to uh, kind of take this technology we've built and, and create a true ecosystem. And where that application falls will be interesting, right? Is, is it going to be DeFi uh, or will it be some other uh, some, some other like micro economy? Like I know their, their NFT market uh, is still kind of has it was it's been that number two ecosystem for quite some time so uh, i'd like to see like what applications really start getting built over there yeah and i guess to take like the long-term bullish view although i have them in the hot seat like you can look at this as sort of like their 80 dollar eth moment where you know we've seen a lot of distribution where soul was heavily held by um institutions vcs like we know almeida now had 10 percent of the overall soul supply and they definitely have to sell that now um and so we've seen a lot more distribution of the soul supply in total um and we now learned that serum was controlled by ftx but if that sort of becomes more a community project and the serum tokens are distributed in a better way than the predatory tokenomics they had before then maybe that sets a good precedent for other projects and all of a sudden you have sort of a grassroots community that's able to build it from the ground up in a way that's way better than it was before. So there's definitely a, a bullish case for Solana, but right now, you know, things are looking bleak and maybe, maybe this is the time to buy because maybe it doesn't get worse from here. Yeah. Zero or very high for Solana is kind of how I see it, <laughs> but uh, I'll take it analysis. over the... <laughs> Yeah. My, my intense TA. Um, so for the, the cool throne of the week for me, it's a pretty easy one. E stakers in all this madness, they're getting incredible yield. I think I checked a dune dashboard earlier today that said, uh, Lido stakers were earning between eight and 10%. It depends on the source that you look at, but with all the increased demand for block space in the midst of all the volatility, you've got a, a lot of MEV and a lot of tips. So those, those validators are having a field day. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if these yields stay where they are and then on top of it, ETH stays deflationary, I don't really know another more bullish setup in crypto. So ETH stakers definitely have my cool throne of the week. Yeah, the most satisfying chart to look at this week has been the ultrasound of money chart, where it's just been a, a straight line down in terms of deflation. Like we're now deflationary since the merge. And yeah, it just, yeah, makes me happy as an ETH bull. Yeah, I feel like I've said it a million times this week, but the, uh, I think, okay, I agree with you, Westy. That's the coolest chart to look at. And the second coolest one is toggling proof of work simulation uh, and just seeing how much uh, minor block rewards that we've re removed from the market, right? And considering that uh, minor rewards are commonly turned into sell pressure as miners sell off uh, these rewards to subsidi subsidize the electricity costs of running their miners. Um, it's it's pretty interesting to think about where we would be if there was another 800 850 million dollars of sell pressure coming um you know the economic hardening that's really uh that the merge 
brought to Ethereum is, is just really impressive. Uh, and it's, it's really hard not to be bullish, uh, especially when you see how chaotic times are so beneficial to a base layer. Just echoing that it's pretty, everyone could imagine in a bull market, you know, people are putting risk on, they want to get diversified into different assets. You'd expect gas prices to go up and ETH to burn, but you know, at least in my head, it didn't immediately pop in as a thought that bear market would, you know, deflate the supply of Ethereum by so much, um, who knew bear markets could be so bullish. Westy, who's your uh, cool throne of the week? Yeah, cool throne has been DeFi perps platforms. So the past few days, I mean, since the collapse, their governance tokens have been ripping. So like DYDX and GMX was the main culprits there, but GNS has been doing well, even SNX today. Just all like the DeFi perps platforms. And I mean, the obvious case is because all the traders, the perps traders that were on FTX need somewhere to go and they're not going to trust some sort of centralized venue so they go going to go to some decentralized venue um but while this is like sort of like the short-term trend i also think it's going to be the long-term trend where people just choose to trade on venues that are DeFi, um because you don't have that that risk of someone running off with your funds but also i think these platforms are going to get way way more efficient in the next few years uh building out their products and so yeah i got i got to give my cool throne to the the DeFi perps platforms yeah, it's super interesting too, because like with NFTs, they were kind of born in a self custodial environment. So like everyone, for the most part, trades NFTs through OpenSea, where they they keep custody with their own wallet. And like it's the other way around with with perps. You know, it kind of started on on sexes, and you see that people got used to that. But it'll be interesting to see if over the longer term, people can get more comfortable just interacting with DApps. But I tend to agree with you, Westy. I think that uh, that's where the future is heading. A slightly more unanimous cool throne, Zero uh, X NGMI, the DeFi Llama founder. Man, just again doesn't stop shipping. Uh, recent, in light of the huge FTX drama, he posted and created and posted a centralized exchange transparency dashboard. Uh, and this dashboard kind of just like highlights everything you'd need to know about uh, some of these exchanges. And ultimately, I think we all want to see like true proof of reserves that are like verifiable on chain. Uh, but I think this is just like a great step in like pushing in that direction. Uh, and like it, you know, it includes like the the amount of deposits they have, if they've been audited. If so, here's like a link to it with it. You know, it tells you what the date was. Um, so you know, definitely just a step in the right direction and such a quick response to uh, the one of um, you know the second largest exchange blowing up. Yeah, that's a good one. He's always shipping. But I guess in terms of like actual proof of reserves, it's like so many questions still remain. It's like, who are the auditors? Like, what is their credibility? Um, and then at the same time, what is their liabilities? Because just the reserves themselves really doesn't provide you all the, the, the full picture that you actually need to make an educated decision as to whether it's safe or not to keep your funds deposited on exchange. So yeah, step in the right direction. But I think we still got a very long way to go. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's kind of funny how like these audits are just like taking a look at at point t like, you know, time at time. Why do they have enough? Uh, assets to cover their liabilities or their user deposits when you know the the speculation around the uh, gate gate.io uh, and crypto.com is just like they sent them the eth just so they could take the snapshot and look you know meet the requirements of the audit which that's just su such a broken system and for uh, an industry whose motto is don't trust verify it's it's pretty shameful that we've just like yet to hit a point where you know we have on-chain verified uh, proof of reserves for entity, entities that are this like large and important to the to the success of our industry. I mean, we should have, in theory, like real time data looking at the chain and the state and understand proof of reserves. Like there shouldn't be you shouldn't need auditors in the first place to take a snapshot. Like it should just be clear as day. Here are the numbers at this very moment, or at least in the last block. Like it should be very clear. Um, but yeah, I mean about the llama like you can put the llama any week on the cool throne like the man ships a product like every single week it's ridiculous so i gotta agree with you yeah i like how you called him the llama <laughs> i've never heard anyone refer to him as that maybe i'm, I'm not gonna try his ad his ad is way too like zero x ngmi no i'm gonna say the llama <laughs> very fair very fair uh dan you want to take it over to the flip side chart of the day yeah let's do it
We got a dashboard here uh, by ALIK110, A-L-I-K-110, uh, and he kind of broke down the FTX drama and where we are now. Uh, it's just like wild to see, you know, these, these wallet balances just collapse to zero um, as they were either exploited or uh, pulled off exchange by a back door. You know, we still don't even have the full picture of what actually happened. Uh, and it's just like wild to you know see the ledge at which those fell off once that bank run first started occurring, and then uh, the final funds were kind of pulled uh, by a co either a combination of exploiters or uh, again we don't even know if it was like a an inside job type backdoor um, breakdown here. Uh, so yeah, just like actually getting the visual visualization from from Flipside's data here, it's 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 honestly just painful, um, and you know. I just want to give a special shout out to, to Flipside on this. You know, Flipside has the most uh, comprehensive on-chain data in crypto to get the insights you need to work smarter. And just having the ability to instantly query this data really highlights the importance of, uh, you know, what this industry is capable of in terms of on-chain um, verifiable data, right? Like we can watch this in real time. And many of us uh, who are spending the day on crypto Twitter certainly did. Uh, and, you know, you know, using Flipside as the tool to get that done just makes life so easy. Uh, and be sure to check out the show notes. We have a $75 bounty in there paid in USDC. Uh, so if anybody wants to compete uh, in that bounty, uh, you know, Flipside's been so gracious to sponsor that one for us as well. Uh, and, you know, I guess my question really here is, you know, where do we go from here? So, you know, like we're at the, we know what the FDX drama is. We don't really know why it happened. Uh, but the question is, like, who's going to come out on top of this? And, you know, I think, Wes, you mentioned DeFi per protocols is a good one. But, like, I guess I just want to get your take on, like, what does this mean for our, for our industry? Like, what? How do we move forward from this? I think just in general, the only people left here are the people who really believe. Like, it, like if you haven't sold and you're not gone off crypto Twitter by now, then you're not leaving. Like, this has been the most brutal week in in the industry's you know nascent existence. So I think we'll come out stronger on the other side. But I also fear, you know, the regulatory fallout, you know, like people like all the headlines are saying, oh, like crypto broke. Like it's like, no, crypto didn't break. Like DeFi was fine. It was a centralized entity that that really, you know, did this. And shout out to JP Morgan actually put out a note clarifying that, you know, I wouldn't have expected that from an entity like them. And then, you know, they were also doing a DeFi transactions like a week ago. So I guess I got to start giving them a little bit more credit. But uh, yeah, I'm just a little bit worried that. The regulation that comes from this and between Terra, Celsius, BlockFi, Almeida, FTX, like they've got a lot of ammunition at, at their disposal. So uh, that's definitely concerning. Um, but in general, I think that, you know, we've already talked about pushing towards proof of reserves. I think we'll get more regulatory clarity for sexes. Um, I think there's going to be good things that come from it. I think there's going to be bad things that come from it. But at the end of the day, like it is what it is. And now we just got to do our best to kind of right the ship. I've been I've been happily surprised so far with the response by uh, I guess you call it tradfi personnel maybe even regulators at least from you know the small sample size I've seen on Twitter and gotten text messages about and whatnot which is that it seems a lot of people are actually realizing the distinction between you know self custody DeFi self custody and DeFi protocols where there's not like a middleman custodian holding your assets. And, you know, custodying your assets with a centralized exchange or a lender like an FTX or a Celsius, because there is such a big and important distinction there. And I think everyone listening knows that. But you would imagine that some people outside of crypto would have a tough time with that. And that brings, you know, fear that regulators would come in and kind of bucket it all into one thing. That DeFi would be regulated in the exact same manners as centralized exchanges and custodians, which, of course, at least in my opinion, is not the right move. But it seems that that's actually not the case. And uh, I think that that's been pretty good. As far as Dan's question, I think that it's a long path to recovery. I don't think that, you know, this is something that people are instantly going to get over. I think that it's going to take a very long time to uh, kind of have confidence and faith come back into the space. I would say, you know, on the probably longer side than six months to a year. But also, you know, I can hope that the true builders will stay here and that, it's the, you know, I think we will recover. I'm confident that we will recover. Yeah, it makes me happy to hear that you've been hearing from other sources like within TradFi that they understand that distinction because, you know, it hasn't been my experience with talking to people, but I hope that you have a, a better sample size than I have. Um, but yeah, we, we really need to push that narrative, which I'm glad JP Morgan's on our side with that one, basically saying that it wasn't DeFi's fault 
Um, it really was C5, these centralized institutions, and we need to push that as hard as possible so all the people that you know, don't really know that distinction or aren't in the know about crypto and what's going on here, we need to make sure that they know very simply that DeFi is not the same as CeFi and understand where things went wrong with CeFi and how DeFi can help like that. That's really what we need to do going forward. If you can't tell, we love data here at Blockroots Research and Chainalysis, the leading blockchain analytics company, shares this passion with us. We use data to extract alpha and find the next thing coming in DeFi, but Chainalysis is doing the gritty work and building trust in blockchains. To onboard the next trillion dollars of capital into the industry, we need to grow safe consumer access to cryptocurrency and promote more financial freedom with less risk. Chainalysis has some of the most comprehensive and reliable data in the space, and they use this data to power a full suite of their solutions that can be utilized by industry professionals. Best-in-class training and certifications are also led by Chainalysis and some of the brightest minds in the space. If you haven't heard of Chainalysis, you got to check them out, and we'll link to them in the show notes. I think one bullish takeaway we kind of can get from this, though, is... Uh, so, and I know, and obviously the recent, we just had like an election cycle come through and there was like a GMI pack that supported 19 different candidates, uh, and they went nine feet, uh, they went 19 for 19 and every candidate they supported actually won. Uh, so that's just like a great thing to know that, uh, crypto educated people are kind of working their way into regulatory positions and like in the lawmaker status. I, I'm really happy to see that because ultimately I do think like, to the average person, the FTX story will be like one of those, it happens, no matter how big of a deal it is, right? Like it happened and then something else happens two months later that's like the new talk of the town and it gets blown, o- blown over pretty quickly. Uh, but to regulators, I don't think that will be the case. You know, like their job is to protect investors and protect consumers and Americans in, in, in whatever country they, you know, reside in. Um, and so I think that like those are the people that I'm most concerned about having to separate C5 from DeFi with. Um, and it's, I think it was probably a good thing that SBF was so tied closely to this DCCPA uh, that Bill he was trying to push through because you know that was relatively uh, not good, right? It was a bit predatory towards DeFi. Like regulating front ends is definitely a bad thing. Uh, limiting kind of the exposure that regular people can get to DeFi is like a, a net negative. I uh, you know like the full libertarian other side of the spectrum view is that DeFi should be uh, as equal and open as as email is or as the internet itself is. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I worry most about like how we how we bring this issue to regulators. Um, but uh, and aside from like the Luna thing, like I really wish Terra never happened because otherwise it really would be just central, centralized entities that are kind of have like collapsed on themselves. Um, but yeah, no, I think. I think the concern and focus needs to be how do we get regulators on our side uh, and and limit the regulation to CFI and letting DeFi kind of continue to, to grow and develop. So like it blew up, but it worked as it was intended to work. Like nothing actually broke. It just kind of got exploited and went to zero. So if you want to call that getting broke or not, I don't know. But uh, it, I do think there's a strong argument to make that, you know, a lot of these exploits that do occur, it's it's because it was engineered incorrectly on like the coding side. It's not, it's not the protocol that broke itself. So I think that's an important distinction. Um, yeah, I just think that's worth worth calling out. Uh, yeah, first glance of this like disaster, I thought the regulation front was going to be a lot worse than it is. And Dan brought up some great points, but also the, the Republicans winning the House is good to stop any of like these bad proposals getting through any CBDCs. Um, and like you said, there's a lot of great representatives that are crypto aware um, and know the distinction that can fight for us, as well as new new teams within crypto forming. So now Paradigm now has a policy team that they're sending. A16Z has a team as well, along with the, the, the great folks that have been fighting the fight already. And so, yeah, I feel a lot more positive on the, the regulation front than I did probably five days ago, which makes me super happy because that was like the number one thing I was worried about mid to long term with crypto is, you know, because of this red herring, because of FTX, um, as something to look at, do we get really, really bad regulation which sets us back many years from innovation? But I think 
think we'll be good on that front. Think about how much worse it would have been too if they would have gotten a stable coin put together before all this actually imploded. Like that would have been ten times worse because then you would have had UST Terra stable coin, you would have had FTX's stable coin, and I think it was even even our first episode. I was I was asking you guys, do you think BUSD or FTX's stable coin will be the most dominant? And you know, you actually kind of had to think about it. So that could have gotten really bad really fast and posed like a much bigger regulatory risk than than it even already does. So I guess I'll uh, count my stripes for that not happening. Yeah, no kidding. That's actually a great point, Sam. Uh, and stable coins are, and you know, in my opinion, one of the killer applications of crypto, uh, and how we'll we'll probably see mainstream penetration from stable coins. So. Uh, any harmful regulation would be such a problem for for our industry. Uh, so that does feel like a bullet dodged without a doubt there. Uh, and you know, even on that DCCPA bill that SBF was pushing forward, you know, he kind of grouped stable coins into two bucks, buckets and it was, uh, you know, fiat backed like USDC or Tether um, and then basically everything else in another bucket. And that just like is clearly not uh, a fair way to do it. Uh, there's so much diversity within that second bucket, right? Like you can have purely algorithmic stable coins like UST from Terra, or you can have CDP style like, uh, you know, DAI or some of the, uh, you know, even like, or you have like the hybrid model of Frax that's a little bit of both. So it's like there's so much discrepancy into what an on chain stable coin can be. I mean, how we have like JPEG, which is backed by NFTs, like, uh, there's there's so much diversity there that we need way more thoughtful insights into like what that actually looks like. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's a great point. It feels like a complete bullet dodge that FTX didn't really get the opportunity to kind of build out that stable coin. Yeah, knowing what they were doing with customer deposits, I mean, you already know what they were going to do with the, the U.S. dollars that were backing that stable coin. It would have been definitely fractionally reserved. A lot of that money would have been sent to Almeida to do God knows what. So yeah, they're saving a lot of things, um, both like Sam on the regulation front, pushing that DC CPA bill through as well as, you know, FTX getting bigger and bigger and bigger where this impact was even greater than it was today. Yeah, I think that's the optimistic way to look at it, which is it's awful, terrible. We have $10 billion in genuine you know, retail institutions, funds who lost money, but this could have gotten way bigger if they'd managed to get a stable coin out. Um, there's more than just one way that they could have perpetuated this, what appears to have been, you know, a giant Ponzi scheme. And I guess you, if you want to be optimistic, you could say we're lucky to have caught it when we did. Um, we're lucky that people are going to learn the hopefully learn the lesson of self custody. And it definitely could have gotten way worse. It's just so cringe too. like SPF on Twitter right now is saying what and then going H in the next tweet, A in the next tweet, P and then P like he's he's just toying and like almost making a mockery of like what he did. It's just absolutely pathetic. And then you see videos of him with Tom Brady and, you know, you had Larry David as a, a, you know, an advertiser on their commercials, like everyone's friends and families knew FTX. It's just a bad look and it seems like he doesn't care at all yeah it's so horrible also given like all the people who had their life savings on ftx all the funds that are now insolvent that were you know great people doing great things like now they don't have their livelihood anymore and here he is like joke tweeting one letter at a time like it just i've already unfollowed him like it's it pisses me off it really does truly a piece of shit truly what blows my mind is how we still like we don't know what the hell actually happened and that that part like i don't know i don't want to get like off the conspiracy theory deep end but just how like well connected sbf was you know he's the he, like top five largest political donor it's like it's like there's a lot of lines that start getting drawn very quickly here and uh i don't know it just leaves me with more questions than answers and i just, yeah i just find it so frustrating how like you know, we can look at the on-chain evidence and we continue to like learn the lesson of where there's smoke, there's fire. And it's like, well, it, it looks like you operated a massive Ponzi scheme and you've given me no reason to think you haven't. Uh, you haven't come out and said anything. Uh, it's just so strange to me. The whole situation just feels so wrong. Um, yeah, it really is heartbreaking. 
Westy, you had a pretty good Twitter thread the other day on like a, a kind of your conspiracy theory over what actually happened to FTX. Do you think you could go over that? Yeah. So I was thinking through like how could Almeida lose such an incredible amount of money? Like we now know that they were probably worse traders than they were marketed as. Um, but at the same time, like eight to $10 billion is a huge hole. And so I figured it had to be something structurally wrong or something that they were taking on constantly that was causing them to lose money. And I came across the their liquidation engine. So how FTX processes like liquidations and how it works is that essentially it's supposed to, when your position gets pretty close to liquidation, not quite there, it starts to uh, dial down your position. But what it really does is there's uh, these backstop liquidity providers, which is just another term for Almeida, uh, but they technically allowed other people to come and be these providers, but no one else did. It was only Almeida. And they essentially take over the position before it reaches liquidation. And that's supposed to, you know, help markets be more efficient, um, whatever uh, jargon they used. Um, but essentially, um, when you look at something like Luna or UST, where prices were falling at such a ridiculous rate, and it was such a one-sided trade, that when Almeida took on these liquidations of Luna longs or UST longs or even shorts when you had some sort of short squeeze, like the prices are moving so much, so fast, that when Almeida took on these positions, it would have been extremely, extremely hard to hedge anywhere else. And so they likely took on these really like losing positions where, and you saw what Luna's price fall from, I think it was like $60 to fractions of fractions of fractions of a penny in three days and so uh, i think something along these lines where you had really really fast price movements and almeida was forced to take on uh those new positions that's something like along those lines is where almeida could have got like a huge hole and so that's where sort of my theory comes in yeah that that makes a lot of sense to me too like something structurally wrong with their process and then like being like, oh shit, like let's try and cover this hole now. And then months and months passed and then they still couldn't figure it out. So I, yeah, I think that theory makes a lot of sense. I guess I just am still dumbfounded that they were publicly going, yeah, like we'll bail out BlockFi. Like we're the heroes. Like we'll bail out this company and that company. And like, we're saving the market. Like they were totally lying, uh, just to the public and totally misleading people. And then, you know, Sam doing the, we're buying back and burning FTT every Monday. It just seems like, they really like, even if they did have a structural problem with their liquidation engine or some other thing with some of their processes, like they knew that they were in a hole is at least what it feels like. And they opted to still try and get people to deposit into the platform, even though they knew that the people depositing were at risk. So that's just really unfortunate to me. And then I totally agree. I think that it's probably the most, uh, the most logical theory I've heard as to where the hole came from. But then you look at over the weekend and, you know, FTX had a ton of their funds. I don't know exactly how many hundreds of millions, but high hundreds of millions drained from the FTX wallet. And FTX spokespeople said that they had no idea what was going on, meaning that it wasn't the liquidator or anyone who was legally supposed to be moving those funds. How could we possibly assume that that wasn't SBF and friends? Like, yeah, it's speculation. There's no evidence, but how could we assume that it was anyone else besides a high up at FTX that had access to those keys and was just, you know, stealing the remnants of the funds that this wallet has? It makes me tend to believe that even with, uh, you know, f maybe something that made them lose a lot of money in the first place, that was a poor design, uh, maybe an actual mistake in the long term. They ter even if they didn't start as scammers, they, they sure as hell became scammers. And there's, I think there's a solid chance that they, uh, they had malicious intentions the entire time. Yeah, the sequence of events there on that uh, the final day with all the funds, the remaining funds being drained uh, by what looked like a couple different exploiters are completely suspect, right? If you just like think about what happened, so FTX and FTX's U.S. sites went down uh, as all of these funds were dis disappearing. You know, user user funds uh, looked started appearing at zero on those websites. Um, you know, they, were, they pushed an app update through it, I thought I saw. Uh, so, like, there's all these different things happening while the, you know, the FTX wallets are transferring funds to different accounts. And somebody would have had to have access to way too many po like, 
way too many different portions uh, of the FTX platform uh, for that to not be an insider at the company. So to me, it seems like there's really only two logical options here. One, it was an insider, or two, uh, somehow a hacker got into the FTX systems. But even that, it's just like, if they got into these systems today, like was that just in spite of all the recent events, or like what, what motive would they have at this point uh, to make FTX look worse than they already were? So I don't know. I, I, I agree that the, the the story that gets painted uh, by the events that have come to light looks very very grim, and then you have no comment from SBF saying like, hey, this wasn't malicious. Like they've they've made no effort to to try to clear their name by any means. Yeah, I just don't even understand though. Like if you're an insider at FTX, you understand crypto well. Like you know if you're moving around hundreds of millions of dollars, there's nothing you can do with it. Like you're not gonna be able to cash it out. Like I don't understand the motive at all. So that's the one thing that makes me think maybe it was an outsider job and someone really just looking to sabotage because you know everything's on chain. Everyone can see it. You can't even interact with Tornado Cash. Not, not even is there like enough liquidity in Tornado Cash to actually do anything useful. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't, none of it's adding up. And I just like, I want answers. And SPF tweeting HAPP and, you know, kind of making this into like an album release. I saw someone tweet, like, it's, it's not helping. Like, just issue a formal, you know, document explaining exactly what happened and do it as soon as possible. That's, that's really all we want is, is answers. Yeah, it seems like there was another exchange. I think it was Kraken that found the identity of the person that stole the funds. I'm not sure how. Maybe one of the other addresses they used was tied to a different exchange account. I really don't know, but it seems like they may have found the person and that it was an FTX insider. But yeah, the motives don't really make sense. Like if you were a lower level like FTX insider that didn't know about the funds being stolen, then you're fine from like a legal perspective, most likely. So why would you go ahead, steal all the funds, and now now you're responsible? But if you're an insider, like like you said, like w what's the end game with the funds? Like you know, everyone can see it's coming from FTX and it's in these wallets. Like you're gonna get blacklisted from selling on exchanges. I mean, they did a good job in swapping to ETH and Dai. It shows that they know what they're doing. Um, and so yeah, it makes you question. Like, who is it? Why? There's just a lot of un unanswered questions, yeah. Yeah, I, like, the early speculation was, you know, this was at, going down on Friday night, uh, and people were like, oh, well, it could be the liquidators. And it's like, first of all, no liquidators are moving assets Friday at 8 p.m. Uh, second of all, like, to your point, they were smart enough to flip out of USDC and USDT, which are commonly blacklisted. Uh, so they were in, you know, uncensorable assets. And... It's just, so it's clearly like a person who understands crypto, which again, kind of points back to the insider, um, in, the, the insider thesis. And he like, yeah, they're using like cow swap in one inch to get the best prices, right? And like avoid MEV attacks. So it's, it's clearly someone who has some indication of what they're doing. But then again, like they didn't even like route things through flashbots. So I don't know. It was just like seemed so sporadic and random. It's like, and then, you know, we're talking about motives, like, Maybe this is just your last FU if you're like going down with the ship and it's like, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to, we got 100 mil in assets left or whatever the number was. Um, it was much more than that. But, you know, I'm just going to take the rest of this with me and just burn it all effectively. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah, some insider that knows that they're done at this point. They have a couple too many drinks and they... uh decide to steal all the funds and say, I'm going to go out swinging. That's the only explanation I can think of. I have the exact same theory, but instead of a couple too many drinks, it's that SBF is in Adderall withdrawals right now. And that's why he's being all sp sporadic and crazy. But you know, um, yeah, might sound stupid, but that's totally my theory. <laughs> the shortage it's hitting everyone. <laughs> Uh, Dan, I'm actually curious. So we've kind of talked about FTX quite a bit, and I feel like everyone's kind of getting tired of even hearing about it. So I'm curious to change lanes here and ask you about what you think of the uh, Cosmos 2.0 proposal, Prop 82, not passing. You know, what do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, so to me, it's like more bad news compounding. Right? Like if you think about what Cosmos is, you know, they kind of like helped expand uh, their entire ecosystem, funded a lot of public goods that created... Uh, you know, the Tendermint stack and the IBC technology. 
Uh, and you know, the next step of the Cosmos Hub's existence is really uh, to facilitate the growth of the interchain and really help this ecosystem uh, become w bigger and, and more successful. Uh, and so Prop 82 is like really, it was a signaling proposal, uh, basically saying, hey, here's the direction we want to move in. Uh, and it was an entire new white paper, right? It was a 26 page white paper. So a ton of different information uh, that covered like two new primitives in interchain security and liquid staking. Uh, and then it, the, the economic growth engine that was kind of like built on top of those two primitives and then also revamping uh, the Atom monetary policy. So again, it was like four really big and groundbreaking uh, pieces that were like a lot of people had different problems with different things. So uh, the reason that it didn't pass was it had uh, if one third of the community or if one third of the voters vote no with veto, uh, then it only takes one third to kill the bill uh, or the, the proposal. And so I think the final count was like 36 uh, percent with no with voted no with veto. And so because of that, it was killed. Uh, and, you know, it sounds like they're going to try to put push each piece through separately uh, and kind of see like where the contention really stems from. Uh, you know, some of the like the more diehard cosmonauts were like, all right, well, screw it. Let's if you don't want to be a part of it, let's just fork it in our like make a new chain where this is what the direction we pursue. Uh, but Zaki, uh, Ethan Buckman and Jack Sampling, we're all on a space today and just like sit, like calming everybody down, you know, like these are the guys that you know, helped write, write, write the white paper and like kind of built out this direction uh, for the hub to go in. They, you know, obviously we're upset about it not passing, but they're like, all right, everybody needs to calm down. Like forking the chain is not the answer here. Like we need to talk to the validators that voted no with veto uh, and kind of like see what, what their contentions are. Let's put this thing through in a couple different pieces. Uh, and, and instead of voting on everything at once, you know, yeah, like break it down and see like where the contention are, resolve those problems, and kind of, you know, kind of move in this direction gradually. Um, which like I get it, you know, there was a like a was a huge proposal that had a lot packed into it, but in my mind, like it's time to build. You know, we're in the depths of a bear market. It's time to start moving. And the Cosmos Hub today, like, is it doesn't have too big of a purpose in my mind. Um, and I, would, I, I liked the concept of the Atom 2.0. I, I really did. I think it made a lot of sense, you know, this using the scheduler and the allocator to create this revenue stream uh, that kind of offset uh, changing the new monetary policy, which was cutting back inflation. You know, like having a stronger economic model for your chain is incredibly important. You know, we've seen that with ETH. Post-merge ETH is such a fascinating asset now. Uh, and it's such a healthy ecosystem. So to me, this was a great step in moving in, in a more exciting direction. Um, and again, it wasn't even like implementing new technology. It was a signaling proposal. So basically just saying, hey, we need to build these things. And so like the way I summarized Adam 2.0 in, in, like, in my own head was this is just about shifting the direction of the Cosmos Hub uh, and not necessarily about implementing anything today. Uh, and so, you know, kind of like wh what's next for the Hub is... Uh, interchain security is still supposed to go live in Q1 um, of next year. And uh, to be honest, a vast majority of Atom 2.0 hinged on the success of interchain security. So maybe it's not the worst thing in the world that this didn't pass because um, if there isn't a lot of traction around inter interchain security, then the economic engine, uh, I, I don't believe the economic engine would have ever taken off. Uh, there wouldn't have been enough revenue to really offset the atom, decreased atom emissions. So net net. You know, we, we do really need to wait and see if interchain security uh, gains traction. You know, so, again, that comes out in Q1 of 23. So that's really like the next major thing for the Cosmos Hub. I'm personally shocked that they did the proposal like as one thing. Like, isn't it sort of like the Cosmos vision to break things up into their like different parts? I don't know why that they would propose like the entire thing. And so by choosing one, you had to choose some other section. And I know me reading it, I'm sure you guys would agree. There's some parts that you agree with, like they should definitely implement this. There are some parts, like for me, the inflation for the first three years that are sort of questionable. And so like, you don't want to take all the, the bad parts with the good. You do want to separate those out. Um, but I don't know, Dan, if you've been looking at the conversations, are there specific parts that people disagree with? Like, is there a reason why they said no? Um, would love to know more. Yeah, like a lot of that stems around uh, the monetary policy with Adam and like 
where the inflation flows to. So it's like they want to fund a community pool as well as a treasury. And the, a lot of the community has a problem with the treasury because that's going to be run by uh, sort of like a meta governance structure. So there's going to be councils that are part of a large, larger Cosmos assembly. Uh, and that's going to all get ratified through the Cosmos, um, uh, the charter that's coming through. And the, char the details on the charter aren't finalized yet. And so a lot of people were like, hey, well, if you're going to pass this monster white paper and now, like this is the direction we're going to move in, then let's actually hash everything out. Let's finalize the charter before we say this is the direction we're going, uh, which it's hard to it's hard to really disagree with that, to be honest. Um, you know, the charter is really going to determine what the governance structure looks like. And if you're moving to a more complex governance structure, then I, I do think you should probably it's, it's hard to say that you shouldn't finalize what the structure itself is going to look like uh, before that's the direction you commit to. And, you know, with the bear market, you can make the argument that watching some of these other protocols go through different governance structures and seeing, seeing how it plays out for them could make more sense, right? Like with this meta governance structure, maybe you want to watch MakerDAO for a couple months and see uh, if that new system that they're implement, implementing gets traction because they, the two are, are different, but they, uh, you know, they rhyme. Um, D we saying DYDX kind of move in this direction as well. You know, recently they talked about doing some of this meta governance as well. Uh, so most of it's really just around like, hey, we don't even have the thing finalized, and then you're going to push all of these pieces through at the same time. Was there any contention around the the size of the inflation? Because that's where sort of I had some contention. Because like you said, like we need to have Adam as the the pillar asset within all of cosmos and if you have some ridiculous inflation all of a sudden the value of an individual atom is going to decrease and so i'm not sure if that was any contention or it wasn't just governance structure yeah so my first reaction was very similar to yours and i was like whoa so the goal was to uh eventually lower inflation to one percent after about 36 months uh, but that 36 month transition wouldn't start uh, until Interchain Security was bringing in enough revenue to start to offset the decreased long-term emissions, um, and it, you're right. So the the day one was there was like a big inflationary print of Adam, uh, and that was flowing to the first chunk was flowing to the community pool, and then the second chunks were or subsequent chunks after were flowing to the treasury. Uh, and so they initially changed it so that they're like, all right, we're going to mint to the community pool, which is controlled by Adam govern uh, Adam governance. And that was really just to fund the public goods and creation of new chains. Uh, it's kind of this, the essence that I was getting that they wanted to, like basically public good funding. And then the treasury, uh, they were going to do one four million uh, at a mint, and then they would have the optionality of voting on ten subsequent four million prints. And so, like governance would have, again approve each of those. Um, and that the treasury would really fund the creation of, of like more atom chains. And so like, maybe you're, if you're creating more chains, then like you're increasing the scope of interchain security. Uh, and then that creates more consumer chains. And then with more consumer chains, you ultimately grow and expand into having the ability to have, um, more revenue streams for the scheduler and the allocator. Um, so it's basically like trying to just start up the flywheel uh, of the cosmos ecosystem and ultimately lead to a bigger brighter uh, ecosystem that would increase the funding for the cosmos of itself one thing that pops into my head is that this is you know overall the change is pretty bad for validators so like if i'm running a validator now i'm probably charging a little fee to my stakers so you know i have 25, I don't know, whatever, a large amount of Adam staked with me. I'm getting 18% APR on all that Adam. I'm taking a 5% cut of all that's delegated to me. That's not, you know, my Adam with the emissions going down so much, you'd assume validators, you know, probably aren't very happy right now. So maybe like doing the whole governance proposal is one big proposal kind of forces them to support it. Whereas if you can split it up into little pieces, they are able to pass things, you know, most of the proposal while that one caveat, which is that the emission rate goes down so heavily, they might be able to fight against and uh, that might make for an easier fight than fighting against the whole thing. That's complete speculation. And I just wonder, you have any thoughts on that, Dan, because you're way more in the weeds on Cosmos than I am. Yeah, you're actually exactly right. So 
this basically broke down to like the largest members of the core team voting yes and some of the larger validators actually voting no, uh, no with veto. And there, a lot of it is around like, you know, this is like you're affecting their revenue. Uh, but one thing important to consider with the de like decreased long term inflation is uh, revenue from the interchain security model. So when when consumer chains lease security from the Cosmos hub, they're still paying for it in the form of potentially issuance or some like fee agreement where you're taking a percentage cut of uh, transaction fees that occur on the consumer chain. Uh, so the, the idea is the revenue from interchain security is offsetting the, the decreased inflation. So you're still like generating the same level of revenue, uh, but now it's in less inflationary atom tokens and more in true protocol revenue. Yeah, I'm just looking at it too. I'm on Mint Scan right now looking at like the votes of Prop 82 and Coinbase, the largest holder, didn't even vote. And then you've got Binance, the fifth largest node operator, didn't even vote. Like, it just seems we have a lot of problems with governance, and that's, like, pretty inherent to the, the future roadmap of Cosmos. And I like the bet that they're taking that, you know, there is going to be good governance structures in the future. But they need a token that people can rally behind now. Like, there is no chain there that, you know, people rally behind. There's no marketing. There's no community. And I've been seeing a lot more people talking on Twitter how important community is. And like, while we've known it for a while, I do think it can't be understated. And I think that they need to fix their tokenomics like as soon as possible. And the fact that they can't even agree on the 2.0 white paper is just not the greatest look. Um, but yeah, there is cool stuff in there. So I'm, I'm optimistic on the future of Cosmos. I just like where Ethereum is starting better right now with how sound its monetary policy is. It has a clear roadmap with, you know, PBS and then its roll-up centric future. Like, I just feel like that's a lot cleaner. And I think this could be the point in time we look back on in the future and think, you know, monolithic chains kind of died during the bear market of 2022. And now you've got Ethereum with its roll-up centric roadmap. And then you got things like Celestia, Fuel, and these modular stacks. And, you know, Cosmos can fit into that as well. But I think it just really hinges on them creating a better community and improving their tokenomics and value capture. Yeah, the Cosmos ecosystem really needs a killer app. And I don't think they've found it yet. Um, you know, if you just, like, look, like, Uniswap or Curve or Aave or Compound, like, the DeFi ecosystem on Ethereum does have these killer apps that get true traction. Um, and we just haven't seen that really take off in in the Cosmos ecosystem yet. Uh, so it, that's why I was so excited for like something like Atom 2.0. Uh, but even interchain security in itself does create the possibility, like the hardest barrier to entry of creating a Cosmos-based chain uh, is creating a secure and reliable validator set. Um, and you know now that you can just inherit uh, such a, a pretty strong high level of uh, security from the Cosmos Hub, it does make onboarding new chains pretty easy. So, you know, liquid staking will likely be the first consumer chains uh, come again Q123. Uh, so it'll be it'll be interesting once liquid staking, you know, starts becoming more popular. You know, we've, we've seen how popular staked ETH is uh, from Lido. Uh, they're also, you know, Lido is building in the Cosmos ecosystem. So maybe these liquid staking providers will end up kind of get, get you know, kickstarting DeFi within the Cosmos ecosystem. Matt, I'm curious, you're a DYDX um, user and you really like uh, kind of looking into DYDX. What do you think about the potential success of them moving to Cosmos app specific chain from StarkX? Wouldn't call myself a DYDX user because you're not allowed to trade based in the US, but I do think they'll see a lot of success um, moving to the Cosmos app specific chain. They have a couple big hurdles that they're going to face, like MEV. How are they going to deal with MEV right now? They don't have to. So I think that's the biggest one, which is validators are going to have the ability to reorder transactions, which might degrade traders' user experience. DUIDX's biggest strong suit, its most attractive thing, is its stellar user experience. If they lose that, I don't necessarily think they'll be able to maintain their market leader status with D, uh, GMX, GNS, Mycelium, etc., so I think that they definitely, you know, there's some risks there, but the benefit that is having a decentralized order book, order matching and risk engine, and therefore being able to return trading fee revenue to token holders is just such a, such a big benefit for them. It really moves their tokenomics from something that's not attractive, not at all, at least to me, interesting to, you know, really probably the most attractive besides like an L1, like Ethereum, 
that's you know burning supply i would say the most attractive tokenomics of any project that i could really think of although there's no concrete numbers we can assume that in 2022 they probably have had at least nine figs in trading fee revenue that's a massive amount of money being returned to token holders um i don't think we really see anything like that anywhere including in ethereum so i think for token wise huge plus you can't think of anything bad for it for trading experience we'll have to see hopefully they can manage to deal with some of the risks that are involved um but at least from the from my experience listening to the team spaces podcasts at conferences they are probably some of the top builders in DeFi. So I think if anyone can figure it out, it will be DYDX. That was a pretty good answer. <laughs> Hat tip to you there, Matt. That was damn good. One thing I've been thinking about on the Cosmos thesis is one of the things with DeFi is it's it's tough to have like on and off ramps. Like you kind of have to go through exchanges. But with Cosmos having a um, USDC chain, as well as there's a project Kata that's building an on and off ramp for Cosmos. I wonder if that becomes their value proposition where let's say you have a lending market like Mars, you could immediately go in, like buy Atom, like borrow against it and then withdraw that money into your bank and actually use it in the real world. And so does Cosmos like, sure they're having their struggles right now, but maybe their DeFi ecosystem takes off because they have that ability to go from the real world into crypto and back. And maybe that's the next step of DeFi adoption in, in general is having that ease of on and off ramp. That's an interesting theory. I hadn't thought of that at all. But I mean, at the same time, you'd still be KYC'd and like, like it's essentially like circles your exchange at that point, right? You just, they kind of abstract your account like away from you is kind of what you're saying. But it's also le less steps, better UX. And yeah, you're being KYC'd, but you would be on an exchange anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's not the best. Maybe you can have an on and off ramp that's anonymous. I feel like Kato, they may have KYC as well, but I'm not sure if they'd be doing any tracking at the level of USDC um, in terms of like if regulators come to them, I'm not sure how much data they're capturing. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of questions surrounding it, but I think it's it's a cool narrative that could take off. I've talked about this a little before and I think you guys kind of like faded me and whatever, maybe disagreed with my thesis here, but I think people often fade USDC's importance. Uh, I think that having a Cosmos native USDC is probably the biggest and best thing that could happen for the Cosmos ecos ecosystem. I especially think this because we live in a world where like we already live in a crypto world where you want to be able to transfer your money between chains easily and having USDC native on multiple chains makes this easy through the likes of Stargate, Synapse, etc. So having, you know, an easy bridging experience, a quick bridging experience and a safe bridging experience is just so beneficial being able to go from, you know, you at ETH on just to go from, you know, base layer Ethereum to DYDX token as when it's, you know, presumably a Cosmos token. Uh, I think that that's a huge value proposition. I also think that USDC or sorry, circle chain might be able to have like a huge value proposition as a hub in the spoke system that is Cosmos as people like come in through circle chain to go to DYDX or to, you know, maybe even go to Osm to go to Osmosis or wherever they might go. I think that circle chain is going to provide uh, a lot of value to the Cosmos ecosystem as well having a native USDC and that that's not something that should be slept on. Yeah, I'm 10 out of 10 with you there, Matt. Uh, I think that makes a ton of sense. The ability to onboard with stable coins specifically is so important. You know, if you look at historically, the only way to get into the Cosmos ecosystem uh, was to buy Atom on a centralized exchange and then work your way in and, you know, like, uh, then you're on, then send it to your Kepler wallet, IBC it to Osmosis, and now I'm in Osmosis, I can, uh, you know, swap to any uh, interchain asset of my choosing. You know, now Binance just listed the Osmo token, uh, uh, what was that, maybe a month ago, and USDC is launching Circle Chain. So now I have three different ways to come into the ecosystem. If I want, you know, if I'm like okay with volatile assets, I have Atom and Osmo, Osmo now. Uh, and if I'm looking for stability and just want, uh, you know, one to one stable coins, cool. I have the, like, one of, you know, most people's favorites, USDC. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense that there's multiple ways to enter the ecosystem now. And I think if they can just figure out to get a couple key DeFi elements in there, uh, you know, like they have the decks in Osmosis. It sounds like Mars is building uh, their 
you know, they're, I really like their model with like the outpost. I think that's going to be really fascinating. So now they have lending. Uh, so they're starting to like kind of add, a, add to their arsenal. You know, Kava is getting more and more popular. Their TVL looks pretty healthy. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what they can do, uh, especially with interchain security, lowering the barriers to entry to create more chains. It'll be really fascinating to watch this ecosystem grow in the next bull run in my mind. Yeah, strong agree there. I think that was a pretty good uh, episode, and I think we can end here. But uh, Westy, Matt, thanks for for joining us on this one. Uh, We appreciate the last second fill in there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. My pleasure. Got to give a shout out to Chain Analysis on being the people to make sure that uh, the FTX hackers don't get away with those funds. So thanks, Chain Analysis. Yeah, that's right. That's a good call out. (laughs) All right. See you guys next week. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good one.